Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the special session um, on reducing avoidable disaster deaths through effective mitigation response. Uh, we'd like to thank you for attending this event. Um, and just to let you know that we do hold these events once a month. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. Just like in all events, there are some housekeeping rules that we just have to abide by. Uh, this is not house cleaning or anything, it's just pure housekeeping. Um, please, during the event, will everybody remain muted during the presentations? Uh, questions or comments can be entered into the chat box. Okay, timekeeping is very important. Uh, this event will be recorded and will be made available on YouTube afterwards. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. Uh, we're just like a quick introduction to our speakers. These are the speakers who will be partaking. We'd like to really extend our thanks to each speaker individually. Uh, next one, please, Alex. Okay, this is the breakdown of the timetable. At the moment, we're just in the housekeeping and uh, welcome speech. Uh, so we'd like to, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of ADN to the special session. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. Okay, we'd like to extend a special thanks to Dr. Khadija for um, arranging this and playing such a crucial part and for all her help and support throughout you know she has been absolutely amazing um adian would also like to extend our thanks to each speaker individually for the parts for their time and for imparting the expertise you know to help um prevent avoidable disaster deaths and also most importantly you know the attendees to this event um, it wouldn't be the success that it is today, ADN, um, these events or the sessions themselves. Next slide, please, Alex. I'm going to pass you across to Dr. Khadija to carry on with this and give you more of an introduction on the event and everything. Uh, please remember there will be a questions and answer session after this. And um, thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Over to you, Doctor. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, everybody. Everybody, and welcome to the webinar. First of all, let me thank you, all of you for coming, attending to our webinar today. Let me start by saying a few words about my own background. My, uh, my name is Khadija and I am a postdoctoral researcher at Sultan Qaboos University in Water Research uh, Center. Uh, my worst work uh, about management of groundwater, flood and runoff. Generally, I work on management of flood and natural uh, disaster management, especially flood and earthquake. As you see in previous slide, our topic today is reducing avoidable disaster death through effect mitigation and response. This webinar will take about one hour and 45 minutes. Uh, if you have any question, please ask at the end of webinar, please. Uh, move to uh yeah thank you uh i graduated from the university of tehran faculty of environment with the phd degree in environmental engineering uh, and i focus on management uh, um, water resource using simulation optimization and conflict resolution models also in 2013, I got my master degree in natural disaster management from the same university and research on multi-hazard 
please go to move to another slide. Thank you. Uh, these are some of the fund and scholarship I have received for my current position. I was awarded the uh, postdoc scholarship from Islamic Development Bank. Please move to another. Yeah. I, I work in uh, an engineering company after graduated from university with bachelor. I work on a road hydrology. Then I attended master degree uh, in disaster management at the University of Tehran. I focus on multi-hazard event in urban area, particularly flood and earthquake. Immediately, I began PhD study. Uh, uh, after finishing my master degree, focusing on water resource management method, especially in field of groundwater. I use the management methods such as conflict resolution and fallback bargaining. The output of this work is the article published in journal, as you can see. After finishing my PhD, I started doing uh, research and lecturing. I am lecturer at the uh, Applied Science and Technology. I have been working with ADN as a regional coordinate about uh, one year. Yes, uh, please, yeah. Um, uh, we have some uh, uh, special, uh, we have a special uh, speaker in this uh, session, uh, such as uh, the uh, Professor Zare and uh, uh, please uh, Lauren, go on. Uh, Dr. Niku and Dr. Nick Sohan and uh, Sana Mogimi and Dr. Mustafa Mohabek. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you again uh, to Adian and Dr. Ray for this opportunity. Special thank also to all speakers for accepting our invitation. Uh, I also thank you all audience for participant in this webinar. I ask that you give your full attention to our guest, Dr. Ray, a stage for you. Please continue uh, your session. Thank you very much, Dr. Kabiji. That's brilliant. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Nibdita Ray Bennett, and I'm one of the founding presidents of the Avoidable Debts Network. And the other founding president is Dr. Hideyuki Shiroshita based in Kansai University in Japan, and he will be appearing on the screen shortly. I am an associate professor in risk management based at the University of Leicester's School of Business. So thank you very much for joining today's special session on reducing avoidable disaster deaths through effective mitigation and response. Once again, a big thank you to our esteemed speakers, Professor Mehdi Zarei, Dr. Mohammed Niko, Mr. Mohammed Nikoshah, Nick Sukhan, Mr. Sanam, Ms. Ms. Sanam uh, Mogimi, and Mr. Mustafa Mwageg for accepting our invitation. Once again, I would like to thank Dr. Khadije for coordinating, coordinating this event. And lastly, I would like to thank my ADN team for putting this special session together, especially Lauren, Rachel, Hideyuki, Shahid, Sroshta, Alex, and Julian. Who forgot to introduce his name in the beginning. You have seen him, Sir so Julian Quedzi uh, from ADN. So let me introduce Avoidable Deaths Network briefly. So Alex, can we move on to the next slide? Thank you very much. So ADN is a global network. It is diverse, dynamic, inclusive, and global membership network of experts, practitioners, researchers, policymakers interested in avoiding human deaths from natural hazards naturally triggered technological hazards and human-made hazards in low and middle-income countries. We can move on to the next one. And ADN was launched in 2019 at the fourth summit of the Global Alliance for Disaster Risk Institutes in Kyoto in Japan. We are often misunderstood as an NGO. ADN is not an NGO. 
Edin is based and led by the universities of Leicester in the UK and Kansai University in Japan. This is a joint enterprise and implemented in collaboration with regional coordinators like our Dr. Khadiji based in Iran. The University of Leicester offers MSc in Risk, Crisis and Disaster Management, and I am the Program Director, and Kansai University offers BA and BSc in Safety Science. So to learn more about this program, you can visit our website or you can email me directly or to Dr. Hideyuki Shiroshita. So we can move on to the next slide, please. So why do we exist? ADN exists to help policymakers, practitioners, and researchers to make better decisions to save lives and reduce injuries to achieve sustainable development goals. By 2030, we want to be recognized as global leaders on avoidable debts for impactful research, solution, and services. And I'm very pleased to let you know that Avoidable Debts Network is now part of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction's Sendai Framework Voluntary Commitments, which is an online platform. Our voluntary commitments are on the first two targets of the Sendai Framework at the interface with the Sustainable Development Goals. We can move on to the next ones. So thank you. So currently we are doing six interrelated activities. Given the constraint of time, I shan't be going through all these six activities that we do, but the first two activities, which is fostering transdisciplinary ideas, partnerships and solutions, and raising the visibility and awareness of the Sendai's first two targets are important for today's special session. So we can move to the next one. Thank you very much. So we launched the first special session on avoidable debts on the 4th of December 2020 at the International Conference on Geographical Science for Resilient Communities at Makerere University in Uganda. The aims of the special sessions are twofold. The first, they are knowledge exchange and engagement webinars delivered virtually to the public for free with the aim to raise awareness on the concept of avoidable debts and their avoidance through theoretical or practical solutions or both. Second, the aim is to raise awareness on those debts that are often not on the mainstream agenda of policymakers, practitioners, and even academia. For instance, our pre previous special sessions have raised awareness on debts from nutritional crisis, from snake bites, dog bites, from scavenging, and etc. So however, today's special session is rather mainstream. The speakers will tackle mainstream subjects such as mitigation, both structural and non-structural, and its vital role in reducing avoidable disaster deaths. In 2021, we delivered five special sessions in collaboration with host institutions across five countries. For 2022, this is our first special session, so welcome to our special sessions. And the next one will be on 25th of March on exclusion and avoidable debts. And I hope you will join us again. Now, if you have not joined Avoidable Debts Network, please feel free to join as an affiliate or partner or an, ad or an advisor. My colleague, Rachel Nantume from ADN has just dropped you a message on how to join ADN. So you have it on the chat box, you can click it and join. So we are currently, we can move on to the next slide, please. So we are currently capturing the impact of our special sessions, which started in 2020, as I mentioned a little earlier. For this, we will run two polls. We will launch the first poll now. Hideyuki, may I request you to run the first poll, please? And the second poll will take place after the last speaker's talk. So with this note, I'm going to stop talking and um, Thank you very much for joining. So Hideyuki, over to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, my name is Hideyuki Shiroshita. So as Nibedita mentioned, in order to self-evaluate our special session, we always ask you to help us by participating in this quick pause. So I have already, you know, uh, launched uh, the window. So please answer just two questions. Very quick pause. Thank you very much.
Suyuki. Yes. What's the response? I can't see it on the screen. Oh, uh, right. Uh, 61 percent. So, yeah. So we, few, we give a yeah. few more seconds for 80 percent. Yes. Yeah. So please kindly answer these two questions. Thank yes, you. please. Yeah. So Hideki, we've got the result, isn't it? Would you like to talk us through a little bit, very briefly? Yeah, still 61%, so oh, should 60. we find four, wait, forward? Yeah, I think the issue is maybe some of our speakers, the speakers won't be mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's okay. gone up to 66%, so may, may we request uh, all the participants to take part, please? Just another 30 seconds, Hiduki, and then maybe yeah. we can close the poll. Okay. Yep, yeah, I think it's three minutes now. Yeah, 60, percent Yeah, okay. Yeah, time mm -hmm. to end the poll. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Right. Your results. Can you see the screen? Yes, we right. can. So, yeah, this is in the result of the first poll. So, as for the first question, 30% uh, answer yes, and then 10% uh, answer no. And then, as for the second question, uh, regarding, you know, the current knowledge. So, yes, uh, yeah, it's very difficult to give some, you know, comment. Uh, very, you know, that diverse, you know, so no. but uh, uh, after this, this special session, we hope, you know, uh, you got uh, some knowledge from uh, the special session. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hideyuki. Okay, so I would like to invite our first speaker. So can we have our first speaker on the screen, please? Yeah, these are the slides. So, yes. So, have we got Professor Zare? So, yeah. Lauren, have we got Professor Zare? I mean, I can't see it, honestly speaking, somehow on my screen. Yeah, there is Professor Zare. Okay. So, it's an absolute honor to introduce Professor Mehdi Zare. Professor Zare is, an, is a professor of engineering seismology in the International Institute of Earthquake Engineering and Seismology. He is an associate member and head of the geology division within the Department of Basic Sciences at the Academy of Sciences in Tehran in Iran. So Professor Zare, thank you very much for joining us today. So the floor is yours, please give us your talk. Thank you. Uh, hello everybody and thank you uh, for inviting me to this session. Um, uh, I want to uh, focus on uh, some aspects of one of our uh, projects uh, on the region of Tehran in order to uh, explain uh, how we have estimated the risk of uh, earthquake possibility uh, plus the other uh, geohazards. Uh, if, uh, if you go to the second slide, yes, this is the cities uh, in, the, uh, in Tehran and region around Tehran. Uh, you see the, the dots, uh, the black dots are the places with inhabitants uh, in the shorelines of, uh, of the Caspian Sea and uh, in the southern part of Algor's mountain belt, you may see the, uh, the most um, um, inhabitant uh, um, areas uh, uh, and the most uh, focus of the population. And when we go to the next slide, uh, we will see uh, such um, uh, dense, density of the population uh, around Tehran uh, and 
the cities in the uh, shorelines of Caspian Sea. You see the city of Tehran um, uh, uh, and uh, black uh, and the uh, um, red um, margin around Tehran in the southern part of the photo. And uh, this shows that uh, actually more than 22 percent of uh, the Iranian population are living in this uh, area. Uh, if you go to uh, next slide, uh, we may observe uh, in the last 2020 years, the historical events, historical earthquakes have occurred around Tehran. Uh, uh, please uh, click on the yes. And one after another, when you click, yes, you, we may see the historical earthquakes which have been uh, occurred in this region. And uh, toward uh, the last millennium, you see the, uh, the location of the earthquakes have been uh, mostly in a, uh, in a region uh, of uh, about uh, 300 kilometer uh, radius from Tehran. But uh, the most important question is that uh, around the city itself, we may not observe a major earthquake. Uh, please click. Uh, to yes, uh, and the next clicks give you. Uh, please continue to click. Uh, you you may see it. these are the 1830, 1957, and uh, 1962, 1990, and the the last one is 2004. Uh, therefore you see that um, all the faults around the, around the city of Tehran um, has, um, have uh, the major uh, uh, events, uh, but only the, 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 the city, the uh, city of Tehran and the region around it had an any event. This may show that uh, in the city we may have a seismic gap. We, uh, we may expect a, a major earthquake after a, a, a more than 3,000 years of silence. Uh, next slide. Please go to the next uh, slide, please. Yeah. Uh, and if you uh, take a focus on this uh, map, uh, on these maps, uh, on the map above left, you see uh, previous one, please. Don't change it. Uh, please back to the previous one. Thank you. Uh, uh, on the map, uh, no, no, next, next, uh, the next one, please. Yes, this one, don't, uh, yeah, this one. And if you look at this map, you see uh, on the left, uh, figure uh, above, you see the uh, position of the faults. In the right side figure, you see the uh, location of the landslides. Uh, on the uh, right side uh, bottom figure, you see the uh, location of the drainages and um, rivers along the uh, city. And in the left side, bottom figure, you see the uh, land subsidences. And uh, when we mix up uh, these four 
um, hazard potential in Tehran. Uh, please go to the next slide. I think there's just a slight delay, but it, it will come up shortly. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, you see uh, that uh, in the region toward center and southern part of Tehran, we had higher level of earthquake hazard. And um, uh, uh, considering uh, three other two hazards, such as landslide, land sustenance, and uh, flood uh, hazard. Therefore, uh, the regions uh, having more population toward the south uh, are located in the uh, more hazardous uh, areas. Go to the next slide. Please. It should be on its way. It seems to take a few seconds to, to show up. Yeah. Uh, and as I told you, if we focus on the uh, population distribution in Tehran, we see that uh, toward uh, the south and central part of the city of Tehran, we have the highest uh, level of uh, population uh, density. Um, and I should insist that in the same areas, we have uh, the highest level of uh, vulnerability because the burnout um, um, and um, suburban um, urbanism um, might be fine in these regions. Please go to the next slide. This is the unstable structures in Terra. When you look uh, at the uh, burnout and unstable structures in Terra, uh, you, uh, uh, you observe that uh, most of the uh, regions in the center, central part toward the south um, of uh, the city uh, are representative for uh, burnout and unstable uh, buildings. Uh, uh, please remember that these area are the same uh, region having the most uh, concentration of the population. Therefore, when we focus on the risk, uh, uh, please go to the next. Next slide. It's on its way. Yes. Uh, map for uh, four type of natural disasters in Tehran. Uh, the districts uh, in central part, south, east, and southwest of Tehran are. Uh, the, uh, uh, showing the highest level of uh, geo uh, uh, type, geo hazard risks. Um, if um, we want to be focused to reduce risk level and uh, to reduce the mortality of a possible uh, future. Um, earthquake, uh, this should be taken into account that the, um, the um, areas having uh, the highest level of population and uh, the highest percentage of burnout and uh, unstable buildings should be changed. Change means um, reducing the population um, and to uh, renewing the uh, building uh, types 
and forms in this region. Uh, please uh, go to the next. I think it should be another one. Huh? Or this was the last one? No, I've, I've clicked for it, so it should come up in a second. OK. Uh, and this is another, uh, another try to understand the uh, uh, second order uh, disaster. For instance, uh, fire after earthquake. You see that uh, 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 the same uh, risky regions in the central are the um, to the um, fire with uh, an earthquake uh, having a magnitude greater. Uh, please go to. Yeah, uh, this is the uh, risk map uh, uh, induced by earthquake. And uh, that uh, it, it is a, uh, a great um, area of um, sense from the southern part of the city uh, are representative uh, risk uh, of uh, fire. Uh, fire after earthquake. And, uh, but even now, uh, the focus on the central part as the risky zone is uh, uh, is not negligible. Uh, and the next one, was it the last slide or? No, hopefully it should be on your screen in a second. It's earthquake prediction for Albor's belt. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yes, uh, however, uh, a major task force that we have worked uh, during uh, last uh, 16 years has been the earthquake prediction, especially for the region around. Uh, very important to understand of the probabilities of the earthquakes around uh, a, a, sim a simple represent uh, representation of one of our uh, efforts in order to show the uh, uh, the cluster of uh, higher probabilities in central Albors toward uh, Caspian shoreline, which is uh, not very far from Terra. Um, this is a midterm earthquake prediction. And um, actually, we are working uh, on um, in more precise data in order to uh, calculate a bit less uncertainties there. Uh, um, assess. In fact, we do the earthquake prediction, but the levels are very, very high. Therefore, it must be useful. Um, on the uh, other hand, we are, uh, we are 
and uh, uh, we uh, have uh, in more than uh, 50 uh, earthquakes, including small earthquakes, recorded around in the last 25 years. We have been focused on this of data in order to understand, understand what uh, is um, as uh, more precise earthquake prediction model. Um, okay, I think that this was the last slide. And uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, again, in, in the, yeah, um, I, um, uh, the thing that I, I have focused was um, uh, a representation of uh, earthquake uh, risk studies, especially for the city of Tehran, in order to, uh, to understand the level of the risk and based on uh, such to um, uh, uh, try the earthquake uh, um, risk and the exposure of people to the uh, earthquake risk. Uh, very much, and uh, I am ready. Uh, uh, Thank you very much, Professor Zare. Um, um, we are very sorry for the network. I think the network hasn't been very well, and we knew that there will be few challenges in Iran. So sorry about that. And I hope the audience has able to get the gist of your talk, which is absolutely amazing, the nexus between physical geography, hazard, human population, rapid urbanization, growth, development, on, and so on and so forth. I think we will be able to pick it up later on. There is a question for you, Professor Zare. So Mr. Ali, we have noted your question and we will take it up during the Q&A session. So thank you, Professor Zare. With that note, our next speaker, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Mohammad Riza, who is an associate professor of the Department of Civil and Architectural Engineering at the Sultan Qaboos University in Oman and a member of the Iranian Federation of Young Elite. Mohammed, Dr. Mohammed was previously an associate professor at Shiraz University and has published more than 120 journal papers at such a young age. And also uh, Dr. Nico has been the young researcher in Shiraz University, the top young researcher for the three consecutive years in 2018, 2019, and 2020. And also he is Iran's eminent young scientist of 2020. So it's an absolute honor to have a rising star, Dr. Nico on board for today's Avoidable Deaths Network. Avoidable Deaths Network is very youngish. So we are so pleased to welcome you. You are a rising star and I wish you all the very best with your continuous rise in the world stage. So the floor is yours, Dr. Nico. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, I appreciate the time that you kindly allocate for this short talk because we, I guess we are out of uh, time. So I try to manage the presentation to finish in the deadline. Today, a short talk about the reducing flood risk through effective management measures. This study is done by my colleagues, Professor Nick Sohan and his PhD students, uh, Zahra. I will present them, present this talk uh, on behalf of them. Please go to the next slide. As everyone knows, the importance of flood risk management studies and in flood management is gaining importance in order to mitigate it and prevent flood disaster and analyze the flood risk components. In this way, we uh, should take into consideration about the uncertainties and uh, modeling flood and its consequential damage as accurate as possible. Proposing effective management practices for reducing damage and introducing the methodology to 
uh, decreased uncertainties in flood risk is very important. Please go to the next slide. Uh, flood has always been among the two most occurring hazards aligned with uh, extreme weather events. As you see, this uh, diagram that published is very clear that flood nowadays create more hazard, especially considering the climate change. You see in south of Iran, in, 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 in Oman, in Muscat, as you see, in, we have lots of cyclones and these cyclones create most uh, damages to the infrastructures because unfortunately some infrastructures did not design for this flood. Go to the next slide. Another example is about the Shiraz. In March 2019, um, we have a severe uh, flood at this area. Photo uh, of this uh, regions in 1965 shows that the uh, construction in this area was very rare, but nowadays, as you see in these two pictures, um, the uh, old stuff the era is covered by uh, apartments. And at the same time, you see uh, the inappropriate design of infrastructures, especially upstream dams and the uh, capacity of the discharge pipes creates uh, such a, a hazard to this area. Go to the next slide. Uh, the most important thing about this flood, as you see in this picture, there is a gate on the left side and, and this gate and this, uh, this, and there is a discharge pipe there, and also upstream dams of the region that broke during the flood because of inappropriate design. So, as an engineer, we have to take into account the the uncertainties of the flood. Normally, engineers utilize flood return periods to determine the consequence of the flood and designs. So, when we build infrastructures, when we build different uh, buildings in, in, in a natural way. We have to take into account that how we can manage it to, uh, to in the future face to less uh, hurts. Okay, next slide. Um, unfortunately, during this flood in Shiraz, 25 people died and 119 people injured. Also, more than 20 vehicles damaged. Uh, after this uh, flood in March, in April, Again, 25 of April, again, another flood occurred and more than 3,850 urban units uh, damaged. So uh, you see in a, in, a, in a large city, we face two new challenges because the infrastructure's capacity is not designed considering the uncertainties. Please go to the next slide. What can we do? Normally we have to consider to uh, develop an appropriate rainfall runoff models and at the same time utilize the multi-objective optimization methods to determine which uh, solutions can be more appropriate for our design goals. At the same time, we have to consider, as you see the left box, uncertainty and uh, propose on the scenarios that uh, are more robust. Uh, please, next slide. Uh, in a studies that Professor Nick Sohan and uh, uh, it's all uh, did um, before, they normally do this uh, for uh, regions in Tehran. Next, uh, I mean, close to Tehran, about they develop a physical model. Normally, physical model as we are developing here in Oman is very important because we have to make sure that the result of this uh, physical model works well in reality. Because of that, we need good and uh, precise information to develop the rainfall runoff model and make sure it's calibrated well. Again, uh, then we have to develop uh, flood risk management optimization. It's very crucial for everyone to know that in the optimization model, we have to take care of this issue that stochastic sampling also included. And at the end, we determine, we will be able to determine which solutions work well, depending on the budget, of the uh, government to take into account to resolve the uh, consequences. Yes, next slide, please. Another important point about the flood is hazard forecasting, a rewarding system and emergency plans. You see here in Oman, for example, we experienced a shine cyclone. Thanks God, uh, the government uh, I mean, declared uh, one days before to people to get out of the, uh, the apartment next to the ocean. And because of that, the number of this decreased. 
So early warning is very important. Sometimes the government, uh, because of many reasons, do not uh, don't want to uh, spend money because it's not it doesn't make sense to, for example, create large uh, drainage systems in an area that we only have one storm per year. So it doesn't make sense to create large uh, drainage system. At the same time, they are building in Oman, in Muscat, especially five detention dams. One of them is finished to be able to capture the flood in future and reduce the, the, uh, the, the damages to the cities. Next slide, please. So in this way, we have to face the new challenges, too many uncertainties we have. So if, uh, as you try to reach more deterministic values in this regard and deviate from reality, because too much complication is our model, we cannot ignore uncertainties, uncertainties in rainfall, uncertainties in uh, simulation, the, our environment using models. Nowadays, many assumptions are considered in our studies, so we have to take care of that and make sure our designs works well for especially extreme events. Yes, next slide. Here you can see the uh, Talon River that Professor Nick Sohan et al. studied in it before. Yes, next. Um, uh, Dr. Nick Sohan et al. Um, at first uh, modeled uh, the uh, rainfall runoff using a simple uh, lump model high mode and checking the result with the HHMS uh, software and uh, also try to uh, minimize the uncertainty using, using Bayesian theory. At the end of the, I guess, seminar, the chronics are, are, are already is in the webinar and we can explain about the uh, complex systems that can be modeled with Bayesian and the, the, with the high mode results, they, they develop also the uh, HECRAS model to determine the hydraulic of the system and then at the end, they uh, analyze the uncertainty. So water level at its cross section and a station and water extent, and then uh, the damages using risk model determined using the, their methodology in Talon River. Yes, next slide. You see here the results of the sample result of a high mode simulation model that considers the different parameters, including meteorological and also the measure data to be able to simulate the runoff. Why we need simulation model? Because when we have we face the rainfall, uh, we can measure the flood. Why we need model? Because we have many uh, events of rainfall that, uh, will not, that will occur in the future. So we have to be able to simulate the basin if in case that we uh, develop or construct some dams or increase the capacity of the drainage system inside the urban area, what happened in the future? Next, next, next slide. Also, they simulate, yes, they simulate, yes, go, please click. Uh, they simulate in different regions and uh, different cross sections, the, the, uh, the water level, yes, next. This is the samples, yes, next slide. Also about the multi-criteria decision-making, has been investigated in the literature for flood risk. It's a very well-known and easy model. Most studies investigated flood mitigation nowadays and a small number considered uncertainties. However, in the literature, when you see different scientists nowadays try to um, uh, motivate the teams to, inc to include uncertainty analysis and the uh, dynamic precipitation of uh, participation of the multiple stakeholders, and uh, their bargaining situation in this process is very important. Yes, next slide. In the multi-object optimization models, we can consider different objectives for our model. For example, imagine we have a river. We want to construct lev levees, or we want to increase the elevation of the levees to be able to protect, protect our cities. So we can consider failure probability. Why probability? Because we have uncertainties here. Cost minimization is very clear for all engineers. They need to present uh, solutions that have less cost and also river estate that obtained based on a hectare simulation and another also target can be considered such as reliability. Reliability is very important. It means for every uh, single event of floods, from how, how many numbers of them uh, over 
proposed solution can tolerate and can reduce the, the, the risk. Yes, next slide, please. You see, when you develop a multi-objective optimized model, for example, this diagram is take, was taken from the Professor Nick Sagan's all studies. You see, you have a multi-objective optimization. This is a trade-off. You see, left figure. Yeah, it is a trade-off, and this trade-off has different solutions that uh, every single point related to, I mean, uh, a specific cost, a specific probability of failure, and etc. As you see in the right diagram, you see the failure probability decrease compared to current safety standard by utilizing the optimization model. So, so another important thing, the point is that our models is a model. So our model can uh, can made a mistake because of us. So we have to set the inputs, the objectives. We have to utilize uh, uh, very well in calibrated models. And also another important point, we have to be able to uh, simulate somehow the social aspects. Uh, for this purpose, there is a we need a multidisciplinary research groups to be able to take them into consideration. Please next slide. So the end effectives of flood management measures uh, for integrated flood management and climate change adaptation is very crucial nowadays because of climate change. The extreme events such as drought and flood changed in most area all around the world in the global scale, you see this huge situation. So assessment and evaluation of adaptation models, it means we have to change some decision that we made before. Yes, it's very important. Please next slide. Uh, there is only two slides. This is one about the how some um, scientists uh, measure risk, normally living with risk defined risk, um, the probability of harmful consequences is very difficult to measure the risk because it's uh, complex. So now normally risk is related to hazard, H, and vulnerability and the response capability, C. And as you see in this simple equation, risk would be equal to hazard times vulnerability divided by capabilities. So R can be considered as the number of deaths and uh, or affected population. Solving V or C or vulnerability or capability and using N uh, for a number of deaths and P for affected population, we have V or C would be equal to N divided by P uh, over H. So please next slide. So at the end, we can see um, how we can measure the mortality. It's very difficult. Every single, every river basin, we have to uh, do uh, individual studies to see, for example, what is the rate of mortality if the level of the water in the rivers or, or for example, uh, every uh, situation in the dams, for example, sometimes we have um, dam break because of the flood is increased. So, for example, you see in a study they pro they that the Tronix Khan at all done is uh, from the other. So you can see uh, when the water depths increased, the mortality increased. This diagram is utilized by the Tronix Khan at all, and they determined this solution based on the develop optimization model that. For example, 10 centimeters in increasing, I mean, uh, if water depths decreased as about 10 centimeter in scenario two, they have the most reduction of the mortality among all scenarios. So uh, this is the way that we can model the flood. But at the end, I want to add something. Normally our river basin, uh, including countryside and the cities. For the cities, we have to, uh, optimize the drainage system or utilizing best management practices such as uh, drainage system or in artificial lakes or detention ponds. At the end also for upstream uh, of that, I mean the countryside, you can create some small detention dams and optimize their location. This is the way that we can uh, reduce the consequences. Thank you so much everyone and I hope you enjoy this short talk. Uh, Professor Nick Sohan is more expert than me about this talk because it's, it's, it's uh, uh, developed by, uh, by him. So if you have any question, you can ask.
and then he will answer and also I, want, I will be available at the end. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. And um, yeah, uh, thank you also. We would like to extend our thanks to Professor Nick Sukhan as well. We didn't have him today. Hopefully in the near future, we would be able to have Professor Nick Sukhan on board. So Dr. Nika, thank you very much. This was very stimulating. Absolutely amazing with your different scenarios regarding depth hazard reductions. I quite enjoyed it and also the models. Unlike other special sessions where we had social scientists, but today we have got, I would say, geoscientists, physical scientists, engineers. This is absolutely amazing. So, and I also liked your reflection on the models. Uh, models have challenges, you know. So maybe to rectify the models, of course, you need human dimensions and multidisciplinary experts. That was fantastic. So thank you very much. And with that note, I will now invite Dr. Khadije to introduce yeah. our uh, next speaker. So Dr. Khadije, thank you very much. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Miko and Dr. Nick Sukhan. That was a very amazing topic and uh, uh, special. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nick Sukhan. He, he is a very professional in hydrological modeling and coupling them to the optimization algorithm and uh, management methods. Yeah, uh, suggest you to um, follow their uh, uh, paper as Dr. Nico and uh, as well as Dr. Nick Sohan. Okay, let's us welcome to our guest speaker, Sana Mokrimi. She is a PhD researcher at the National Laboratory of Civil Engineering, Structural Engineering Department uh, uh, in the Lisbon and PhD student in Umino. Her research concerns supporting a seismic uh, risk decision making by conducting cost benefit analysis to select mitigation strategies. Uh, she will discuss the, his, uh, her expert opinion on the reducing earthquake debt from effective seismic code in Lisbon. I ask you give you full attention to Sanam. Sanam, please continue your season. Go on, please. Thank you, Dr. Khadija, for your nice introduction about me and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm here today talking about part of my recent um, research. The title of my presentation, as you can see, is Reducing Earthquake Debt by Using Seismic Risk Mitigation in Lisbon Metropolitan Area. My presentation is focused on the development of my uh, PhD thesis uh, with some reason, result and it's possible contribute to uh, reducing the number of deaths in seismic, in seismic events in Lisbon. Um, to start, um, I'm going to play a short introductory video about why Lisbon is a good case to study for earthquake. In this video, we are going to see that um, Lisbon in 1755 um, was um, hit by one of the greatest earthquake in the Europe history, 8.5, and the city become all devastated. Let's take a look. Do you have the sound? I'm sorry, I don't think the audio is working. Um, we can maybe post the video after the session. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I will just give a um, small um, explanation on the video. As, as far as they see the video, it was a two minutes video. Uh, but as far as they see in 7055, because of an offshore earthquake, uh, um, the, in the fault, uh, we had um, 8.5 magnitude of earthquake in Lisbon. Um, so because of the earthquake, people came out. It was 1st of November. It was All Saints Day. So the candles were on because of the religious uh, day and they came out since Lisbon is the by, by shore in 45 minutes, Lisbon got affected by a hurricane, a big, um, um, a big wave of 30 meter came to the city while people were coming to open areas. Uh, the, um, the water and the earthquake was not the only things that affected those candles that were felt because of the earthquake tremble. At the time, every structures was um, with wooden and long curtain. So it was triggering a different type of um, um, incident, so to say, and makes the Lisbon to become uh, a city of ashes and all the uh, structures um, de becomes debris, so to say. Um, so um, although now uh, many things changed since then, but the seismic risk still exists. And this is um, one of the main reasons that needed to come up with the recent study um, that can help um, and guide investment because of the short uh, limited resources to um, choosing the right way to mitigate in order to prepare the city to reduce the probable fatalities and improving the recovery and resilience of infrastructures in case of the next earthquake. Um, and we can go to the next slide. Um, as we saw early in the video, Lisbon, recent Lisbon even is not a city with a high rise building. 97% of the building stock in Lisbon are less than five story building. And um, this, this means um, uh, almost the city is flat. 60% of building stock still in Lisbon are not designed according to earthquake seismic modern uh, code. Uh, which makes um, me to start studying and this um, as a case study. But in order to make my case study more precise, uh, I want to share that approximately 50% of Portuguese building stock and 65% of um, building in Lisbon metropolitan area are from reinforced concrete, while 55% of these buildings in um, Lisbon that are reinforced concrete and less than five uh, stories are not designed for modern seismic code. Uh, so this is the reason approximately the, um, the, the population I'm studying is 25% of the population living in Lisbon metropolitan area, while uh, this number is just a fraction of the all people living in this typology of building in the whole Portugal. Um, we can go to the next slide. Okay. Um, after choosing uh, the typology of the building, we know that these buildings are before seismic code. So we need to find a way to mitigate. Some uh, methodologies are focusing on increasing the ductility in strengthening and stiffening while some others are um, more for reducing earthquake demands and base isolation. The last part is not in case for my studies because I'm studying uh, quite big number of buildings in Lisbon, which I'm going to say in, uh, in, in, in the next slide. But um, so base isolation, energy dissipation is not our case in, in, in return. FRP and steel jacketing. Um, reinforced concrete jacketing for um, columns, bracing and reinforcing infill walls are the mitigation I used for this study. If we can go. Yes. 
Uh, now for um, the methodology of um, progressing, of course, I need the numerical modeling, but since this study is a realistic study, I have the um, variables, uh, I have the material and geometric properties of the exact um, case study of those up to four story building of concrete reinforced. So I can uh, generate the um, many buildings and define with random variables, choosing 200 buildings uh, in each direction. So in total, I studied 400 buildings in Lisbon metropolitan area, uh, resulting the capacity curve for each of the buildings and doing the fragility analysis was the next step. Um, so in order to um, define the um, limited states and um, getting the results from the fragility curve, uh, previous studies were used to be based on Hazush, but um, Hazard of US. But in this case, um, I define fragility curve by the exact um, output of each building of these 400 buildings. Um, the next step um, was for me to uh, do the seismic um, hazard scenarios definition and to characterize hazard for a given seismic area. Um, because uh, apart from this studies of a numerical modeling um, in, in national laboratory uh, where I, I do research, we have a seismic risk platform that uh, I can um, define the scenarios of earthquake and getting the, the map. Um, so I ended up with two seismic area uh, scenarios, one inland and the other offshore, like the one uh, that we had in 7055. And for the consequences, um, I came up with the failure rate and the number of collapse with the direct damage and indirect costs and fatalities and injuries. Um, but to make them all usable, I need to um, come up with a cost um, function in order to, uh, to be able to compare different scenarios that I already mentioned, five different scenarios in different level of retrofitting. So my cost um, function is the cost of uh, implementing the mitigation strategy plus uh, like summing up together with the cost of repair, cost of demolishing in case that the building is in a um, limit that I need to demolish and reconstruct it and cost of uh, relocation, cost of revenue and cost of fatalities. Um, so in brief, um, it's, it's going, I'm going to make a catalog for cost of each component in, uh, in this cost function to be used for the next uh, studies and as well based on these 400 buildings that I'm studying. We can go to the next. So numbers and formulas are enough. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the graph. In this graph, we are seeing uh, the damaged area. If, if we want to be precise, the previous study, which is already existing in Lisbon, is the first uh, graph. And the study that I did with a, a realistic number is the second one. We can see that there is a huge difference between uh, the, the damaged area in each uh, parish, in each neighborhood of um, Lisbon metropolitan area based on the colors. Um, so it's a proof that previous study was uh, a conceptual study that was mainly based on expert opinions and taking the, um, the parameters from um, other manuals, which were not mainly for <clears throat> Uh, for Portugal. But in this study, the numbers and the, um, the graphs is exactly for the same typology of building existing and modeling uh, in, um, in Sismostrat for, for this case. Um, but let's take a look from um, the current study if we want to have uh, intervention. For example, among all those five different uh, solutions, I just bring one because of the short limit of time. 
one intervention, which is the infill walls. If we still look at the map, we can see that there is a big difference with the color that shows the damaged area uh, density. Um, we can see that we are getting from the reddish to become more orangish. So, and from the uh, bright blue, which has the more number of damage, we are getting to the darker blue. So this is a proof that um, with intervention, with um, different scenarios, we are getting uh, less damage area. But why I'm focusing in the damage area for this presentation, if we can go to the next and last slide, please. Uh, as we can see here, the table is already saying exactly the same things as we see in the graph, but in a way that we can understand easier. Let me put my own photo out of this number. Uh, so as we can see here, uh, for the sum of damage, for the sum of loss area that we have, we, I'm, I'm comparing in the table on top, um, when we are having the infill walls as a mitigation strategy and uh, to compare to the do nothing, like right now if an earthquake happens. So we can see that by a very simple uh, way of mitigation, we are almost reducing 70% of our damaged area of loss, which is a huge number when you are thinking of the number of the houses in this uh, typology, the amount of people living in these uh, buildings. Um, but since this um, knowledge exchange session is more about fatalities and how we can reduce the number of dead people, I just want to mention very quick that um, it's, it's simple to get how many people we can um, um, we can save their lives by a simple conversion of the total area, the sum of damaged area to uh, saving lives. So we can go through uh, this the down table quick together. Uh, as we can see in the census um, of Portugal, um, we can see that the occupancy rate for people living in a building is 30 square meter. Uh, on the other hand, not all the buildings in uh, in Portugal, in Lisbon metropolitan area, are the are, are the building with residents. So we have a 20% vacancy rate for our building, which means no one is living there. So if we have a damage in that structure, it doesn't count for fatalities. And from the similar studies uh, with the almost similar type of building, um, we can see that the rate of fatalities is 10%. Um, so by a simple calculation, we can see that we are saving the lives from 519 deaths to 144 de deaths by just applying a simple uh, strategy. Uh, I, I just want to mention that this sum of damaged area based on my um, limit states is the sum of total damage area. So it's a bit in an upper bound and the number of deaths we are going to have after um, applying the uh, retrofitting solution is going to be way less. Just to finish my uh, session, I wanna mention that in parallel to this study, um, to, to whatever I, sh I showed in brief, um, I'm doing the comparison of all mentioned strategy and costs to get the recommendation like for uh, what are the two main strategies that can be used to achieve the greatest reduction uh, in risk and fatalities by spending the same amount of money. So I think this could be as well very helpful for decision makers uh, how to make the city more resistant. And thank you very much for your attention. And in the next slide, I'm just wishing you all to stay safe. Okay, thank you, Sana. That was a very interesting uh, topic. You coupling the uh, decision making and cost benefit analysis to reducing earthquake deaths. Thank you very much. Uh, let's us uh, welcome to our special guest a speaker, Dr. Mahakib. He is an international disaster risk management specialist with 
25 years of experience in the national system, the United Nations and International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement. Uh, he has a coordinate many disaster, disaster response uh, operation in different region and led to the development of disaster management and risk reduction policies, strategies and law and regulation at the national and international levels. He will discuss his expert opinion on the experience of coordinating disaster response to save lives. I ask you give you full attention to Dr. Mahakrek. Dr. Mahakrek, please continue your your yeah. uh, yeah. season. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Norizi, and uh, also Dr. Bennett for for inviting me to this wonderful event. It's a great honor and pleasure to be part of this joint effort, and I also uh, appreciate very much the presentations made before my presentation, I think I equally enjoyed and learned from them. And uh, it's very encouraging to see how academic, especially young academics and experts are actually uh, contributing to this important uh, topic of disaster reduction management and of course, focus on saving lives. So within the time which is uh, given to me, I will try to share with you some underlying and the strategic points that I think would be essential in order for the academic works scientific community to be successful in, in creating the necessary alignment and synergy uh, to save lives of people and protect assets and properties during the disasters. Uh, so uh, if you go to uh, the first slide, yeah, good news is that I have only four slides. The bad news is that I don't have the luxurious, beautiful slides that the previous speakers presented. So I hope you can bear with me with this more conceptual and uh, not mappable, actually, points on the topics on, on coordination. Uh, let's start with this question that why do we need coordination? Is it really a nice a sort of uh, luxurious uh, topic that all the time we should repeat? that we need to coordinate, coordinate, coordinate. I want to explain to you that no, it's not really just the ethical or actually value issue here. We have a serious, serious uh, a relationship between coordination and the success of any disaster reduction management interventions, whether it's technical or as a managerial, et cetera. Uh, one model which is borrowed from the economic actually a school which is very helpful and that's the value chain model. I use it a lot in my own work, says that in order to reach from point A to B and to get our results, we need to make sure that we have a complete chain of values or actions or interventions. Therefore, if we miss one of these rings of this chain, then it means that there is no connectivity and no result or success. So uh, coordination helps us to make sure that we respect and ensure the value chain in our actions. So we coordinate because we need the presence, collaboration, and support of all actors and the sectors that are required in our disaster response and preparedness. Uh, the other point is that we need to maximize the efficiency and effectiveness of op operational planning and implementation. If we do not coordinate well, we won't be able to ensure a proper planning. And planning is a very sophisticated process for disaster risk reduction, preparedness and response. The other point is that implementation of operation according to the set goals, objectives and strategies require that we make sure that all those who are responsible and involved are connected and they are called and actually the relationship and collaboration lines are established very professionally and properly. Uh, to contribute to the clarity of roles and responsibilities, we need coordination. Because without coordination, people may be confused. Who does what, when, and actually in what context. Uh, therefore, coordination is not only about issuing orders and telling people what to do. Coordination actually is about clarifying the roles and responsibilities of various actors and sectors. Uh, to contribute also to ensure effective use of human material and 
financial resources. We have seen in many, many disasters, I've been personally involved in emergency response in various parts of the world, that due to the lack of coordination, there were repetitive, actually, contributions and aid, international aid. There was there were unnecessary, unneeded assistance, and there were non-culturally sensitive, if you like, uh, contributions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So resources would be lost, would be wasted if we do not coordinate. The other rationale for coordination actually is that to enable effective, uh, actually, you, there are some messages popping up. Let me handle this one. Don't worry, Dr. Yeah. Mustafa, carry on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. To enable effective reporting, communication, and information sharing. And there is a big issue. Uh, if we do not coordinate in information sharing, there will be confusion among beneficiaries, those who are affected by disasters. There will be confusion among the relief workers and relief agencies. There will be con con uh, confusion among the donor governments and organizations. So the total uh, uh, sort of uh, totality of the disaster response operation will be confused due to the lack of proper reporting, communication, information sharing and uh, in a coordinated manner. And last but not least, Coordination helps us to link disaster response phase to the subsequent recovery and long-term disaster reduction. And that's the most important part of the, any disaster response operation or any disaster reduction, a measure to uh, reduce the existing and prevent future possible and potential risk. If you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, you have seen this model. There are many models on the disaster management or disaster management cycle, I chose actually the simplest one, one of the simplest, in order to uh, share actually my views on that. Normally we say that disaster management is composed of four phases or in a better term, four sectors and parts because not all of them are sequential in terms of timing. So basically we start not with disaster, and this is a very important point. We start usually with prevention, reducing the risks. And that's the important part of this, uh, this process. So uh, we start with prevention and then we prepare because what we call is residual risks will exist all the time. Other risk reduction prevention measure won't be 100% successful. If we do anything, everything, then at the end there will be some remaining risks that we call it technically residual risks. And they will be there. So for the residual risks, we need to be prepared in order to provide effective response when the disaster happens. So we have emergency management, and after that we have recovery. And recovery is not to build back uh, what was already existing, but what we call it through the Sendai framework for disaster reduction to build back better. And to build back better means that a building a recovery which is reducing future risk. So if you put all these phases or sectors together, then you have a list of topics that should be seen in our planning for coordination. A risk assessment, which uh, usually is composed of hazard vulnerability and exposure. I've seen in the previous uh, presentation about the constructs of, of disaster risk. Yes, until 2009, we had actually hazard and vulnerability, but based on the global assessment report of 2009 issued by the UNDRO, that time UNICEDR, uh, they have seen that many countries reduced the vulnerabilities, but because of the exposure, those vulnerabilities was not helpful. Reducing vulnerabilities, like building on the river banks or the sides of the both long surface. Then you have hazard monitoring, hazard early warning, rapid assessment, search and rescue, relief services, rehabilitation, reconstruction, long term and ongoing risk reduction. So these are the strategic topics that need coordination in each and every of them. Unfortunately, time is not enough to elaborate them, but I just listed for the attention and the use of the distinguished uh, participant and the colleagues. Next slide, please. So I briefly walked you through the phases, but what are the areas for collaborate coordination disaster management? What are the topics? What are the issues that we need to consider and to uh, handled it properly. Disaster risk reduction and disaster management policy development is first and foremost in the context of the national, local, and regional development plans. Under that, we have disaster reduction and management legislations. 
So how coordination is relevant to them? When we talk about the policy development, we are not talking about issuing high level, formal official statements, no. Policy in the modern definition means to create a consensus, an agreement among the stakeholders in the society, with academics, with decision makers, with practitioners about the best solutions that can help a vulnerable country, that can help the vulnerable community to uh, reduce vulnerabilities and then reduce the risk and respond effectively. So, so is uh, legislation and then organizational and operational planning. Below that, significantly uh, coordination is, is pertinent and relevant. And then we have resource mobilization and allocation, coordination of external and international assistance, communication, information sharing and reporting, real time, ongoing and end of operation evaluation, and uh, response recovery and prevention risk reduction nexus which is a critical term these days. We can't ignore it if you want to save lives. As simple as that. So uh, on the last slide, I have a couple of minutes. I want to share with you some personal experiences from my own work in disaster response, all levels. So local level actually, I've been uh, involved from my early years of uh, disaster response operations in Iran, on the flood, on earthquake, et cetera, et cetera. So I've seen that how actually timely communication, information sharing and the uh, communication and planning actual response can directly contribute to the quality of disaster response. Uh, the information that we consider is useful for coordination should have four uh, qualifications. First, the information should be timely. So late information doesn't help. Secondly, the information should be uh, accurate. So general information, guesses, and the judgments doesn't help. So the accuracy is a second uh, qualification of information that can help us. The third one is reliability. What is the source? What is the value of, of the or reliability degree of the information? And the fourth is relevant, relevance. Information could be timely, could be accurate, could be very reliable, but not relevant. So again, the type of information that can help us in coordination of disaster response should be timely, should be accurate, should be relevant, and should be reliable. So these are there. At national level, I've been a coordinator for international assistance during BAM earthquake on 26th of December 2004, where in three months we have coordinated about 400 international teams. And that was a unique operation internationally created a shift because of the excellent collaboration among uh, the government, national actors, United Nations, Red Cross, Red Cross, and SS. And I can tell you that all the pointers I mentioned to you were really observed in, in, that, in that regard. Uh, I've been also elsewhere in Pakistan earthquake in Kashmir 2005. Uh, I've been a few months after that in recovery phase. I could see that because of the a large area which was affected, it was so difficult to coordinate. There were villages on the mountains in the Kashmir area. I traveled actually one by one, and sometimes we could not reach that even in the recovery phase, let it uh, alone during the emergency phase. Uh, so the, the coordination there were actually so critical that it could save the life of thousands of people on information, on access, on relief, etc. Uh, what we call it regional level actually disaster. You can imagine actually Asian tsunami 2004. I was that time actually in interagency coordination of Red Cross in Geneva. And I could see that from Banda Aceh in Indonesia up to Tanzania actually, East Africa, the whole region, two oceans actually were affected. At that time, coordination was so difficult that it took us an international community almost a week or two to realize what happened. At that time, Coordination was the biggest issue. And then in the recovery phase, of course, there were a lot of other initiatives on the collaboration between uh, sectors and actors, governments. For example, the first time that the civil military collaboration in disaster response was born and came up was after the Asian tsunami, because there the typical race agencies were not able to handle it, like Red Cross, others. So the military came actually help. And then we have a new concept. 
uh, at, at the bigger actually uh, disaster I can mention actually the Haitian earthquake in 2010, the Fukushima uh, earthquake and then tsunami in 2013, uh, etc. etc. Then you have actually disasters which become international. So the location is in one country or a city, but the scope and the scale is so big that the whole international community should intervene. And that's not possible only when disaster happens. So we need to spend more time resources to create the mechanisms that approach the planning so it can go. So uh, I'm stopping here, just want to reiterate two points. First is a long-term process. Coordination can't be done in the first hours or days of any disaster, in the sudden onset disaster, or in a slow onset disaster like a drought. I've been in West Africa 2005-06, helping the 11 countries for the drought and then famine there. And it was not really possible because there were actually months of uh, preparation or uh, the time for the occurrence of the disaster. So it's a long-term matter. We can't see or do it actually a few days. And then the second point is that it goes across all sectors and the topics, prevention, risk reduction, preparedness, response, recovery. And here, the multi stakeholder approach is critical. Scientific community, policymakers, practitioners should come together. Thank you very much. I hope this uh, short presentation has been useful for the objective of this session. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Dr. Mustafa. That was absolutely amazing, insightful, and your personal experience really added even more interesting you know, value to it. So I think um, with that note, we have come to an end in terms of our speakers presenting for this special session. So that was fantastic. So now what we will do is we will take a few questions that the audiences have posted on the chat box so I think we can start with Professor Zare. I think there are a couple of questions for you. Would you like to really uh, go on first, please? Shall I read the questions? Or we, we already have forwarded the questions to you. If you could unmute and please. Ah, uh, yes, uh, I am looking. At the uh, uh, one of the audience asked me about uh, the Tabris Falls. Uh, as you may know, uh, last week uh, we had two small earthquakes, uh, magnitude 3, uh, 0 0.43, 0 0.4, uh, in the city of Tabris. Uh, the magnitudes uh, were uh, very uh, uh, small, but uh, since the location and the epicenter was located in the city of Tabriz, um, whole uh, the population uh, has uh, felt the, the event, and therefore uh, everybody have been. Uh, um, worried about, uh, and it, it has been a panic in the city. In fact, uh, after uh, that uh, two earthquake, um, no um, uh, event having greater magnitude has occurred yet. Uh, but however, the uh, North Tabriz fault is. Uh, um, one of the most important faults in Iran. I, th I think we, we, we lost to you, Professor Zare. The question was that from your experience with earthquake um, modeling, because... Professor Zare, we've lost you. So I think... Um, about one, one to two millimeter per year, but in Tabriz fault, it is about six millimeters per year. Therefore, uh, it is uh, um, um, very important um, as, uh, um, structure. Uh, other 
point. Yeah, Professor Zari, the question was that just if you could briefly answer it from your experience with ArcPEC modeling, which is the preferred method of analysis between the model response spectrum method and lateral force method? So if you could just identify which method that you prefer. Uh, for earthquake modeling, um, um, uh, the, uh, in fact, the uh, uh, response spectra okay. uh, is preferred to be used. Okay. Uh, the problem is, uh, in most of the cases, uh, you want to uh, design somewhere, but you do not have uh, sufficient data. You mean, right. uh, when you want to have the record in the locality, you do not have uh, sufficient and proper record in order to model. Therefore, uh, this is a challenge. Always, uh, you want uh, you want uh, to have the best, but you do not have the the data. In such cases, uh, it is preferred to uh, select uh, an uh, event, uh, in, uh, uh, supposing that the situation of that event is similar to the site you want to work on it, and then select the records corresponding to that event uh, for your site. And then uh, you, you may go ahead and work with those data. However, in such case, the uncertainty level might be uh, um, important. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Zare. So Dr. Nico, we have a question for you. And the question reads, as I quote, uncertainty is in and of itself an abstract phenomena. So are there existing tangible benchmarks that have proven reliable to incorporate in your, in your prediction models of floods in built up areas? So what is your answer, please? Go on. Uh, yeah, uh, short answering is that if we be able to estimate uh, uh, uncertainty then we do not need we don't need to incorporate it in our models so the content the, 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 the content of the uncertainty means we don't have any exact uh, answer of our parameters or our variables but at the same time we can have estimations because normally when we have historical data for example scientists nowadays, utilized many advanced methods for incorporating uncertainty. We cannot say benchmark. We can say, I guess uh, you mean, for example, based on historical data, you can do simple um, analysis to determine the probability distribution function of the variables or parameters. Then, for example, if you consider the design period for your structure, for your uh, water infrastructures or anything, and can determine if you consider any return period, how much risk may be remained. For example, you can utilize uh, some uh, approaches like, such as conditional value at risk. This uh, simple indices uh, let you to incorporate the extreme events and determine, okay, based on our historical data, what is the maximum possible amount of risk. Normally, researchers utilize risk assessment, but conditional value at risk can be used for extreme events, such as earthquakes, such as flood, and et cetera. So if we be able to measure uncertainty, it's not uncertainty anymore. Um, normally, um, researchers uh, uh, rely on historical data and, uh, and try to not exclude the extreme event, do a statistical analysis, and also consider the, the joint probability of the parameters, such as, uh, and they use the models, simple models such as copula, to not only consider one variable, but also the joint probability, I mean, joint occurrence of the phenomena. So the simple answer, it, it would be something like that. But I guess, Professor, I don't know is available or not, can uh, say another things. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Nico. I like that answer. Come. So we, we have a question for Sanam. So Sanam, your question is, what would be your technical advice to a client who on the grounds of financial constraints is hesitant or adamant to invest in your proposed remedy for the likely earthquake? Um, first of all, I think I would say that change your mind and consider earthquake an important uh, things to, um, to invest. But generally in this uh, study, the retrofitting solutions are mainly for the whole building. So it's not by individual, for sure decision makers who are the public organizations or um, like public investors needs to uh, make the route or ma makes the foundation ready for applying this type of uh, retrofitting solutions. They can, for example, make it uh, mandatory to have the insurance covering earthquake risk and um, um, applying a higher insurance amount if you are living in a building which is not retrofitted yet so make you uh, like motivate you to do this or like uh, for, for the individuals to give like loan with uh, uh, with low interest uh, and 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 again motivate them to to apply because um, none of these methods could be applied just for the owner of one flat in a six in a four story building, the whole four story building three story building needs to to be retrofitted so um, I think it's it it, it needs time and um, mainly uh, the help from the government. Thank you very much Sanam so uh, Dr Mustafa I've got quite a few questions for you. <laughs> I think there are three questions. I don't know whether you managed to have a look at the chat box. Yeah. So the first yeah. question is, which is quite interesting. I think this question comes from our alien member. So the question is, how do we minimize political interference in the disaster recovery process, especially when it affects the vulnerable groups of women and children? And I'm looking towards you, Dr. Mustafa, partly because you have had a huge making in the Hyogo framework. You have led international organizations, coordinations at an international, local and regional level. I think you are better placed to answer this question and the later two. So first is this question. So sure. I think it's best you uh, tackle this question and then I'll later on give you the other two. Yeah. Thank you. I, I make my best effort. Uh, to answer this question. I, actually, uh, you're right. I mean, let us say, I mean, to all colleagues, uh, recovery is the most complex part of any disaster response and or management with colleagues. So it's, it's, it's proven because it is not really rebuilding the buildings or the physical infrastructure. It's about uh, putting a whole community which is affected physically and psychologically actually back to a normal life. And it's so huge. Yes, so there are a lot of political actually things coming from the government, from local governments, actually municipality, mayors, communities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But but again, it's not only about the uh, rebuilding; it's about reviving the economy, the actually social life of the large population which is affected. So uh, we, we can't really reduce it to zero, the political interventions, because we, we, we but political interventions we are we are talking about the will and the wish of the decision makers. Do, Doctor Mustafa, sorry, I think your mic, your speaker, because sometimes we're not able to hear. So if you could just hold the speaker. Yeah, yes. thank you. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Go on. No, no problem. The best way, as we say today, is to prepare the policies and the plans for recovery well in advance. So it is very, very important that we do not wait for disasters to occur and then think about response and the recovery. It doesn't work like this. So today the issues are so interrelated and, and the complex that it has its own school. A lot of things are happening in the world now to about actually developing the right approach and the policies and the plans for recovery of predictable disasters. What we call it actually the, the disaster risk index. If it's prepared, then we know that what should we do about the earthquake seismic risk or about the geological landslide subsistence or meteorological, hydrological. All of these actually has a required their own recovery plans in advance. Plus, uh, social and the uh, actually psychological economy, a lot of, lot of actually actors. So briefly, 
is, is I know I know that this is not this uh, good uh, sort of solution or answer, but the major point or key point is that to prepare the recovery plans in advance. So every vulnerable community, city, country should have uh, within its what we call a disaster management strategy or risk reduction response recovery plan, the approach and methodology developed well in advance. So when there is a disaster, not everything is not left to the will and the improvised decisions of the decision makers. That that's, might be a short answer actually. Thank you very much, Dr. Mustafa. So uh, a bit of an apology because that question actually came from someone called Simon based in Barbados, not Rachel. So. Uh, so sorry about that, Simon. Simon, you have posted another question, which I, I think that Dr. Mustafa has partly answered it. But what we will do, given the constraint of time, we will send that question to Dr. Mustafa again and get some answers from him and then pass it on to you. So I'm going to move on to the third question that has come from Tom Kelly, my student. So according to Tom, the question is, Dr. Mustafa, it says, Looking at the examples of Hurricane Katrina in the USA and the UK response to COVID, it seems that early warning systems must marry in with a wider principle of cognition, yes. where key decisions must be made based on approaching risk and actions authorized for local governments and responders. Yes. Would you consider this is the key to handling disasters effectively and how do international disasters with many actors settle this issue? It's quite a complex Thank you very one. much. Yes, no, I think that's very pertinent and extremely important. Again, I share with you all my personal experience for during the Hurricane Katrina. 2005, I was the uh, duty officer actually for the Red Cross in Geneva. And then the Kat Hurricane Katrina happened actually in the US, as you know. And the US, as a very well developed country, was really faced with serious challenges. It was a real a disaster in disaster in terms of communication, information sharing and the early warning, et cetera. And that was one of the big lessons that international community has taken, that even in most developed countries, there might be really uh, gaps and the actually uh, areas that uh, can embarrass uh, everyone, even very well developed countries. So Hurricane Katrina, and then the early warning on, on the response to the COVID-19 in many countries, like in the, the UK, I, I, it requires more time, but generally the countries that have developed very, uh, strong referral hospital actually services, they reduce their community-based health services. Developing countries like in Iran and Asia, because of the need of the community, they develop very strong community-based health systems. And for early warning, monitoring early warning of a biological hazard, which is also included in the Sendai, the community-based health system, because of its outreach and connectivity mm -hmm. to the people is so important. So UK and many countries were embarrassed because they invested so much in many years on the referral hospital, the specialized hospital services, that there was no need to have actually community-based network. Yeah. And that was critical for the communication, you know, sensitization, information sharing, public awareness, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, nevertheless, early warning alone is useless. It doesn't start from itself. Uh, uh, an early warning is useful when it is based on a monitoring so in, in the sequential way, we start with the risk assessment, long-term, short-term, and then we monitor the hazards, which are the most pertinent and immense to happen. And then the hazard monitoring can help us to come up with the effective, actually, early warning. So because there was no enough and well monitoring in both Hurricane Katrina in the US and the COVID-19 in the UK, there was no, I mean, it's a reality because WHO, uh, a year before actually the outbreak of the pandemic issued, I was actually reading the article, the statement that there is a worry for a serious global actually pandemic and uh, issue in soon in the future and nobody paid attention. Yeah. And that shows that there was no monitoring system to look at this evidence and the data. Uh, therefore, the early warning could be effective only if it's based on on ongoing actually monitoring. I think this short probably would be helpful because time is so uh, yeah. Tight. I, I can't really elaborate more. Yeah. So thank you very much, Dr. Mustafa. For comments. So Mr. Ali, we have registered your request that you want us to run a special session on landslide. 
if you would like to get in touch with us and help us in organizing that special session on landslides, we are happy to do that. So thank you for that request. So I think with that note, we have to end our Q&A. But before we do that, can we have one a photograph? We would have liked to do that in the beginning, but I think Dr. Mustafa was having a little bit of a trouble. I'm, I'm, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the, uh, Not at all. <laughs> not at all. So yeah. apologies to the audience. Can we have a quick photograph, please? So Lauren, please get ready <laughs> to take the photo. So you do tell us one, two, three, yes, so that we are prepared. Has everyone got their cameras on? Just give a couple more seconds. The DJ. Tandem. Okay, one, two, three. And I'll just do another one because there's a second page of people. <laughs> okay. One, two, three. Great. Thank you very much, Lauren, and thank you to the audiences and the speakers. I think with this note, there's so much to take on for us for Avoidable Deaths Network. And also, you know, if we look into through the lens of avoidable deaths. We've learned so much from Professor Zare, the correlation between exposure, physical vulnerabilities, social vulnerabilities, and also the mitigation measures that are not able to match with all of those different exposures, vulnerabilities, and so on and so forth. And I think from Dr. Nico, we have learned an amazing thing that yes, models are brilliant, but models need to be supported and complemented with multidisciplinary research, experts, human dimensions. But also, I love that uh, Dr. Musma, Dr. Nikoi emphasized the importance of um, early warning systems, emergency planning. So these are vital, and which also, in a way, aligns with Dr. Mustafa's coordination well, yeah. aspect. Well, and we we love coordination, which is part of our avoidable well, well. networks component, which is governance. So that's fantastic. And also for from Sanam, we learned the importance of mitigation and mitigation measures can actually save lives. And we, I love the scenarios. So I think with that note, I'm going to stop here and I'll invite my colleague, Dr. Hideyuki Shiroshita to come on the camera again, say a few words, thank yous, and also run the last poll so that we know whether we have learned anything at all from the speakers and our poll will tell us. Uh, whether the level of knowledge has gone up or not. So Hideyuki, over to you and thank you very much to the speakers and thank you to Khadiji and thank you to our audiences. Thank you, Nibedita. So dear participant, please kindly answer the second question. Just one question I'm writing for now. Yeah. So we will use this result for our self evaluation of the special sessions. We will share the results through our website and annual report as well. Your attendance very important. It's going up. We want the same or similar response rate, don't we, Hideki? Yeah, 60 up to 70. It's gone up to 56. We need a little bit more faster. <laughs> 63%, three more, please. Three more percentage will match it with our. 66, 70% GK. Yeah. And I think the number of participants at the moment. 30. 30, okay. Five. right. So in the pre-poll time, we had 34, I think, isn't it? So we've got the more or less similar sample size. So I think over yep. to you. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, yeah, let me end. Yeah, thank you very much for the cooperation. Thank you. All right. We can't see the results in the UK. We, we can. Yeah, now. we can yeah. see. Yeah. Yeah. The 
biggest group is very confident. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's our majority. Fantastic. Mm. I think this we owe a big thank you to our speakers actually. It's because of the speakers, the knowledge yes. of the participants have gone up. Of course, this is a passive knowledge. Yeah, it's a passive knowledge. It's the knowledge that the participants believe in what they have gained. So the thanks goes to the audiences. Hideki, over to you. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. So yeah, uh, again, thank you very much for the University of Tehran for organizing this event with us. Also, I have a big thank you go to today's host speakers for your you know, very interesting and valuable talk today. And thank you, entire, uh, thank the entire AD and team for your hard work on preparing this session. So yeah, I am based in Japan, uh, based in uh, Kansai University in Osaka. So from today's special session, I reconfirm that Iran and Japan are very similar. So both countries are located at the plate boundary and prone to earthquakes. I remember the bomb earthquake in 2003. Yes. If I'm not wrong, uh, which caused a lot of damage in Iran. And then uh, before that, we have 1995 Kobe earthquake, and after that, we have 20, uh, 2011 uh, Tohoku earthquake as well. So, in addition, the floods are also very common in both Iran and Japan. So, yeah, hazard uh, is very similar. And then it confirms uh, from today's session that there is a, a regional character. Char characteristics to disaster and disaster research. So both Iran and Japan focus on earthquake and climate hazards. Then in Japan, engineering measures have been promoted since 1961, and their importance remains unchanged today. So in addition to hard measures, we believe uh, soft measures such as disaster education, this is uh, about my you know, expertise. And oh, I think, yeah, this kind of, you know, soft measures are also important. So if there will be an opportunity, I would like to learn more about soft measures in Iran. Right. So I am very glad that ADN has become a big network. So this is why we can cover topics from different regions and countries. So ADN will continue to organize special sessions on different themes and areas in the future. And I hope you will keep joining us. So thank you very much for joining us today. Over to Nibirita. Thank, thank you, you and everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good Bye. afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. And Mr. Ali, get in touch with us. Please do get in touch regarding this landslide special session.